What's going on Data Devotees, it's Jameson here. This video is about vectors. What are vectors? How do you use them? How do you create them? And how do they make up a data frame? What's more, we're going to cover a few different common functions for using vectors and for measuring them and other different operations that involve them. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, classes of data, as well as how we can convert one class of data to another class of data when they live inside of a vector. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So I've got our studio opened up with a relatively clean slate, and I'm going to go ahead and press Control, Shift, and N to open up a new script, and I'm going to save this script simply as x.r. Nothing in particular. Nothing very important, but that's okay. So when it comes to a vector, vectors are essentially very simple. We talked about assignment before and that we can assign, let's say, uh, to object X with the assignment operator, we can assign a single value. Now this is called a scalar value. And now object X contains that single value, which is three. If we were to type simply the name of the object and press enter. When we evaluate it, it automatically prints the contents of that object. And this is called auto printing. But what if we want to add more than one value to an object? And for that, we need to essentially use uh, either a sequence, or we can add individual values together with function C. So let's create object Y and inside function C, we are able to add different values. So in this case, let's do one, three, five, and 10. Control and enter or control and return. And that brings us to essentially having object Y containing one through four, in other words, uh, length four or four different elements inside of this object. And the first, second, third, and fourth values are 1, 3, 5, and 10, respectively, as well as being of class numeric. So we're getting a lot of information from this pane up here in our, that shows the objects in our global environment. And this is indeed a vector. Now, don't get me wrong. This is also a vector. It's a scalar value, but I don't mean to confuse you. Uh, it is a vector of length 1. But that's okay. Typically, when we talk about vectors, we're talking about a series of different values that are stored in a sort of two dimensional way. In other words, it goes from left to right, as opposed to tabular data, which goes from left to right, and goes from up to down. So again, we can create multiple different values in a sort of series, and we can combine them using the C function and that is going to create a vector. But this is simply numeric data. If we wanted to get very specific, we can in fact take these exact values. And if we were to add an L to each one of these, which is kind of a strange thing, you don't often see it in R, but just as an example, now these are actually counted as integers. That is, those are whole numbers. They're not divisible. Uh, they don't have any decimal places. There's no need for a decimal point. Unlike numeric, which is kind of an umbrella uh, class, which can contain integer, it can also contain double or uh, different values with, you guessed it, decimal points, non-integer values. But that's not all. So we can also create a vector of text data. So we can choose A, B, and C. And in order for that to be text data, let's go ahead and add D in there too. For, for R to be able to recognize this as text data, it needs to be wrapped in quotations, either single or double quotes, so long as it's consistent throughout uh, function C. And if we go ahead and press enter, now we can see that this is character data or data of class character. We have the values A, B, C, and D, and it's of length four. So lastly, we can look at logical values. And logical values are comprised of trues, falses, 
and NAs. So I'll do a true, a false, a true, and then another true. So very good. So over here in our objects, and I'm going to go ahead and use function remove or rm and remove x from this equation. And we can now see that we have four different objects. They are all, they are all of length four themselves, and they're all of a different type. So we've got our character, a, b, c, and d. We've got logical true, false true, true, and we've got numeric as well as integer. Even though they're, they're the same values, they are recognized by R as a different class. And that's an important distinction to be able to make at this time. So cool. So what are some other common functions aside from using C? Uh, in, in other words, uh, combine to be able to create vectors. Well, there is a very common function. Uh, this is the sequence operator. If we put it in back ticks and put a question mark in front of it, there it is, the colon operator, and it's used to generate regular sequences. So what does that mean? Well, if we were to say, enter one colon 10, and we press enter on that, it creates values one, two, three, all the way up to 10. And we can even save that as another object if we so choose. So that's one very common uh, function when it comes to dealing with vectors, but also we have another very useful vector, uh, very useful function, excuse me, for vectors, and this is length. And so I'm actually gonna change this to four, fun, fun. And so length tells us the total number of elements, or you can also think of it as the maximum position because we have position one, position two, position three, position four inside of a vector. So if I chose, uh, let's see, we'll just delete that and get that out of the way. If I choose Y and I want to call function length on Y, it's going to return four. That's because there are four different elements in length. They could be the same element, but there are four distinct positions that contain elements inside object y. And so that's the same even with text data or character data. That's the same with logical data. And so for example, there's our text data. Here's our logical data. Oop. C was our logical data. But of course, these are all of length four. They all have one, two, three, four positions and four elements doesn't matter if they're particularly unique, but they are distinct from one another, and that's important. Uh, what else is useful is rep. And so this is creating uh, or replicating in order to generate uh, a particular value multiple times over. So if we wanted to choose, and I'm using autocomplete to find uh, the possible arguments we could choose, x would be the value that we want to repeat. So... Now let's do go r and then the next is going to be really there's a variety of things that you can use with function repeat but in this case we're going to use times and i shall enter four so we want to repeat value go r which is a character value and we want to repeat it four times go r go r go r go r awesome and so those are just some common functions that you might use when it comes to evaluating vectors, understanding vectors a little bit better, and so on and so forth. So we've already looked at these different classes, but one way, let's get into classes here. One way that we can identify the class of a given vector is by using function class. So we type the name of the function and inside the parentheses, the only, I'm using autocomplete here by pressing tab, the only argument that it really accepts is a vector or a data frame or a single, singular scalar value or anything like that. So essentially you just put an object in here. We could do class of true, so that's just a, a regular value and it's not stored in an object. But in this case, we could also use, for example, y. 
just to get rid of the confusion here so x isn't confused with anything, we've realized, yes, y is indeed numeric. What does y look like? 1, 3, 5, and 10. And what about z? So z is integer. What does z look like? 1, 3, 5, and 10. Of course, it's just recognized differently because we've kind of made it so. And so if we also include class for object A, it's going to return character. And lastly, class for object B, which we know is comprised of trues and falses, that's going to be logical, right? So function class is extraordinarily important. And it's just helpful for, uh, especially when you get into programming and, and you need to ensure that the data inputs, let's say you're making a function, you need to make sure that it's of a certain class. Well, if it's not of that certain class, um, then you can do uh, some sort of error statement or something like that. Something that tells the user, hey, this needs to be of a particular class if you want this function to work properly. So that's the class function. And we've already talked about kind of character, class character, which is essentially just text strings. We made that with go r. This is all class character. So I'll just simply save that as char or care. And that, of course, shows that it is of class character. And we also looked at numeric, we've looked at logical, and we've looked at integer. Now, one interesting thing about logical is that under the hood, B held our logicals. That was true, false, true, and true. But under the hood, if we wanted to sort of change the class of these logical values to be numeric, let's find out what happens. And actually, I'll just put in a few new values. Just for fun, I'll also show that you can, in effect, abbreviate, excuse me, abbreviate true, false, true, and true simply by entering a capital T. And you can even see the color difference there that R is recognizing these values as logical. And if I run just that, it comes out as true, false, true, true. Now what happens when we run as.numeric, the as.numeric function? Well, it comes out as 1011. And this is extraordinarily important because essentially anything that is true, you can treat as a one, anything that's false, you can treat as a zero. And that allows us to do different things. Like for example, using function sum. And that shows that we have three ones out of the four. So in other words, uh, three of these are true. And we can also use something like function mean. And if we do that, it's going to show us the average between zeros and ones, and that is 0 0.75 or 75%. So three quarters of this vector of trues and falses are true. And that's what that's telling us there. It's essentially saying three out of four, right? Or three divided by four, in the same way that you would take a mean for anything else. So, cool. Now, Let's look at factors. This is a particular class that I want to pay some special attention to right in the beginning. And specifically, if we were to convert something to factor, let's go ahead and take A, B, C, and D. Factors are, in the R language and many other language, languages, uh, in essence, they are categorical va va uh, variables. You're telling R that these are common categories and they should be treated as such during an analysis. And we can think of categorical variables as uh, political uh, affiliation or uh, states in the United States or a condition for a particular patient, whether it's recovering or in ICU or anything like that. So it's anything that really has uh, different levels or different categories in that variable. So here, this is a, a kind of a rudimentary example, but we can say um, found 
and not found. And then we can add like another another class for fun and we'll call it uh, not missing or something like that. And so this is uh, a way that you might want to classify. Um, let's say you've lost your, oh gosh, I don't know, uh, your Magic the Gathering collection and uh, you're recovering your cards all around the house one by one or uh, who knows, your Pokemon collection. I don't know. It's up to you. What do you collect? Baseball cards? Let's, let's call it that. So you lose your baseball cards and you've made a spreadsheet to be able to make sure that you've uh, recovered every single one of them and so they can be found, not found, or not missing in the first place, which is quite good, right? Especially for baseball cards of worth. So um, what we can do here is essentially do as factor and we'll wrap the as factor function and now it's essentially seen as a factor. If I go ahead and save this again and we'll overwrite x, actually not overwrite x because we got rid of that, what does x show us when we print it out? It shows us found, not found, and not missing, and then it tells us the different levels inside that factor. So these are all the different possible uh, values that can exist as categories or treated as categorical data. So that's a key distinction between simple uh, ABCD character strings versus what R recognizes, and you can see with three levels, um, R recognizes this as a factor with three different distinct demarcations or categories, if you will. Why is that important? Well, let's go ahead and plot empty cars, and we're going to plot miles per gallon, and we'll also plot cylinders, right? I'll go ahead and clean that up. So I just ran this. This is the plot function. And on the x-axis, we are, uh, you know what, let's switch that around. For on the x-axis, we want to plot cylinders. And on the y-axis, we want to plot miles per gallon. So presumably, the more cylinders you have, the less fuel economy you have. So therefore, the lower miles per gallon. Let's see what that graph looks like. OK. So all well and good, we have four cylinder engines. They're getting up a little bit higher in the, uh, in the miles per gallon in the fuel economy range. Uh, a smaller kind of subset uh, are comprised of six cylinder engine vehicles in our empty cars data set. And they're existing here, uh, six cylinder in that column. And then we have eight cylinder vehicles. And of course, those are more towards uh, 10 to 20 MPG. So less fuel economy for those particular vehicles with those uh, those extra cylinders in their engines, right? Um, but what's wrong with this plot? And this is why factors are principally important. Well, let's look at the x-axis. So it's giving data for four cylinder engines, six cylinder engines, but also five cylinder engines and seven cylinder engines and eight cylinder engines. Now, these data don't contain seven cylinder engines. And even though there are five cylinder cars, uh, or there have been in history, uh, these data also do not contain five cylinder engines. So what's the big deal? Uh, well, it's essentially treating the variable sil for cylinders as a continuous variable. And that's just an improper way to be able to treat that. So what can we do? Well, we can actually do as dot factor for, oop, we want to do that for cylinders. And now let's see what happens when we run that. Wow, big difference. So now plot, which by the way, um, responds to the different types of variables that you have or the different classes of variables that you have, has, com has produced a completely different graph, right? It's now uh, no longer a scatter plot, which we saw previously. It is now a box and whisker plot. And this is showing the distribution of miles per gallon for each uh, class of cylinder. We no longer see five cylinder cars or seven cylinder cars. R is recognizing this as a category 
and therefore automatically as a best practice it's showing you the distribution here we have the minimum first quartile median third quartile maximum and interquartile range represented by the gray box and so R has again detected that automatically and because we specified to R that empty cars cylinders is in fact a factor or a categorical variable R is going to treat that as such and it's going to continue to treat any sort of uh, text or even uh, numeric variable that you specify as, as categorical or as a factor of class factor it's going to continue to treat those in different types of analyses in the way it should be treating them and that is as categorical data so that's a little bit on class factor and why that's important so we've already seen examples of this but this is really called casting and it's when we do arguments or use arguments like as factor or as numeric so when you cast you can actually change the class to something completely different now here we have class this now if I do as dot factor again that's going to be uh, now it's recognized as a factor with a single level and that level is this now if I want to change it change this to uh, I can actually do a cast of a cast as dot character and so once again it's changed back we've seen that the levels have disappeared this is now recognized as a character string or a text string right and that's we also saw this with uh, as numeric when it came to uh, trues and falses So we change true, false, true, true to 1011, and that allows us to operate it, operate on it differently as well. And so these are casting functions. They typically start with as, and then you can also include really any type of class. In this case, I'm just going to use an asterisk because in code that means really anything. Um, and then you have your parentheses, and in this you can put uh, your vector, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can also do as data frame and so that's an interesting thing that you can do as well let's go ahead and choose y z and a and remember y has these four values which are all numeric z has these four values which are all integer and a has these four values which are character and b has these four uh, logical values as well so once again that's y z a and b and so let's make a data frame out of that so sure enough it's able to create a data frame and this is just kind of to show you that in effect a data frame is just a series of vectors that are lined up and they have to be of the same length in other words they have the same number of elements or the same number of values and value positions in each of those vectors so again we had numeric integer string and logical and the reason a data frame is a data frame is because in essence uh, it is able to hold tabular data but those data can be of different classes again logical character uh, integer and numeric but we can actually convert this with another casting function called as matrix let's see if this actually ends up working or breaking so sure enough everything becomes now so the point of this by the way was just to demonstrate that it's not simply uh, the classes of vectors that you can cast or recast into a new class but you can also recast uh, actual data structures themselves in this case we went from a data frame to recasting it as a matrix now what's the difference between a data frame and a matrix well we already saw that a data frame contains a mix of these different classes of variables right in uh, numeric integer uh, character and logical as matrix a matrix which is different from a data frame 
Even though it's tabular, a matrix is comprised of all of the same class. So what happened? We had logical, we had character, we had uh, integer, and we had numeric. Now all of these have become, look what they're wrapped in, quotations, they've all become character. And why is that? Well, this is something called coercion. I'm going to try and spell it right. <laughs> and uh, so coercion is important because when you use casting and there's something that's breaking the rule, coercion is going to happen by default. Let's see another example of that. Um, and what coercion does is essentially make it so um, the rules of R are being followed. Not only do matri matrices have the same data class, but vectors must also have the same data class. So if I were to choose uh, an A, or just let's just do an actual word, a word, literally, uh, and then I'll have uh, a 1, which is numeric, and then I'll have a 5L, which is an integer, and I'll have a false, which is a logical. So what's going to happen here if I save this in object uh, mix? So what happens? Let's print mix and see what happens. So once again, because we have a text value in there, coercion takes place. One is becomes a text value. 5L or uh, the integer 5 also becomes a text value. And false, which should represent a zero under the hood, that also becomes a text value. In this case, just all capitals false wrapped in quotes. What happens if we go ahead and get rid of the character string in there? So now we have just, again, numeric, integer, and logical. So mix has now converted or coerced these three different classes into, should be numeric, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was, yep, yeah, numeric. So one other possibility could have been logical, but so as numeric, um, this one remains numeric. This integer gets converted essentially to the same thing as a five. And we know that true is a one under the hood and false is a zero under the hood. So this becomes a zero. So this is what's happening with coercion. In order to make the rules of our work, uh, the classes will be coerced. Uh, this is true with matrices where you can only have the same type of class, and it's true with vectors, because vectors can only contain values of the same class. So that's something to keep in mind. And lastly, we're going to take a look at recycling. So if we have a series of values, say 1 through 10, I'm going to go ahead and clear all of these out on that side. And we'll even make that a little bit less distracting. So if we have a series of 1 through 10, and we'll call this x. So again, that's just that sequence. They're all integers, 1 through 10, no problem. Now, if we have something of that is divisible in terms of length, so this is 10 different values. Therefore, it is a vector of 10 elements, or length 10. Now what happens if we include um, or if we create an object called y and that only has half the length of x? So let's run that and let's find out. So sure enough, x is just 1 through 10 and y is 1 through 5. But what is recycling in R and how does that help us better understand a lot of the interactions with code that, and especially with uh, vectors that we're going to be using. And this is, recycling is particularly important with vectors. But if we were to say um, data frame, let's see if this works out. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Hey, it does. So I use function data frame and I put x in there, which is of length 10, and y in there, which is of length 5, precisely half of that. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like. In fact, I'll just open it up in the interactive viewer because we like to have fun here. And so 
x, which is originally 1 through 10, remains to be 1 through 10. Now y is of length 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and look what happens. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, same as x. But once x goes into 6, y starts over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So essentially, because it ran out of values, but it is y is divisible by x, or I should say the length of y, 5, uh, excuse me, the length of x5, um, <laughs> the length of x10 is divisible by 5. It can be repeated twice, in effect. This, therefore, becomes recycled. These values start over in that sequence again, and that's precisely what happens. So uh, what's another example of this? Well, let's create a vector in C of uh, 1, 5, and 10. And we're going to save this in Z. Well, what happens if I say that I would like to take z plus 3? Now remember, 3 is of length 1. It's technically a, a vector of length 1. And z is a vector with three different elements. Therefore, it's a vector of length 3. So what's going to happen? It's going to return each value of z plus the remaining uh, the remainder of the arithmetic operation, or the expression. So in this case, 1 plus 3 equals 4, 5 plus 3 equals 8, and 10 plus 3 equals 13. So that is recycling. Uh, we've taken a look at, in this, uh, different ways to be able to create vectors uh, with C, uh, the C function or combined function. We've looked at different classes from numeric to integer to uh, character strings or class character values, and also uh, logical values, which are comprised of trues and falses. And we looked at some common functions with vectors, not only with uh, the sequence operator or the colon operator, but also how to determine the length or the number of elements in a vector using function length, as well as how to create or uh, replicate uh, a given value any number of times with function rep. We've learned uh, a little bit about how trues and falses can actually equate to ones and zeros under the hood when we use a casting function like as numeric, and that way we can treat logicals with functions like sum and mean. Uh, we also learned about how to create factors and why factors are so important, because factors are ultimately um, telling R that they need to be treated not simply as character data, but as actual categorical variables. Again, casting, so we can, can uh, essentially convert values from uh, text to factor or back to text, in this case, character. Um, we can convert logical to numeric. We can convert data frames to matrices, data frames being a series of mixed classes and, and matrices being comprised of a single class just the same way that a vector is comprised of a single class. We also learned about co coercion. So when you mix different classes together, there is a single class which is going to always win and make all of the other values that same class. And so we determined first that uh, a string or a character is going to convert everything else into character that characters that isn't, and then uh, sans a character value, um, if there is any sort of integer or numeric, that is going to convert your logical values into numeric values as well. Lastly, we learned about recycling and that things get repeated if they are, in fact, divisible um, or if the thing being repeated uh, is... Excuse me. <laughs> if the larger vector is divisible by the vector being repeated, whether it's a vector of length one, of length five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this was an introduction to vectors and how to create them, how they end up comprising um, data frames, uh, which we created, all being uh, equal length vectors, and uh, and what's more, some important functions, how vectors work with each other, and how you'll be working with them uh, throughout. So I hope this was helpful for you. Welcome to using vectors. Feel free to create some of your own and uh, practice with things like casting, checking classes, recycling, some common functions, and, uh, and even 
experimenting with different hierarchies of importance for classes using coercion. That's all I got for you now. Y'all take care.